program says that my title this evening is a call to nonviolent peace building. That developed a little bit into something a bit more specific. It's civil rights, the Hizmet movement, and the liberative power of education. To all my Jewish sisters and brothers that may be here present, Shalom Aleichem, Vechal Sameach, a blessed Pesach to you. To my Muslim sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To my Protestant, Roman Catholic, and Evangelical Christian sisters and brothers, He is risen. Happy Easter. To my Orthodox and Eastern Rite sisters and brothers, a very blessed, great, holy Thursday. And to one and all, may peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with you. There is a well-known hadith or report of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that he once so wisely said, Man la yashkuru nas, la yashkuru Allah. Which means, he or she who does not thank his or her fellow human beings, cannot possibly thank God. So I wish to begin this evening by following in my own feeble manner the sunnah, the example of God's message. I would like to express my gratitude to the two major hosts of our conference. I'd like to thank Dr. Mustafa Gökhan, Shaheen, and all my dear friends at the Atlantic Institute. Were it not for their friendship, love, trust, and entirely unfounded confidence, in my ability to speak adequately about the contribution of Fatullah Gulen to the welfare of the human family, I would not be here with you this evening. I would also like to thank President Dr. John Sylvanus Wilson, Jr., Professor Reverend Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter, Sr., Dr. Alexander Daniel Hamilton VI, the Dean and Assistant Dean, respectively, of this beautiful Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. International Chapel and the entire family of Morehouse College for the inestimable honor of being inducted this morning into the Collegium of Scholars. With absolutely no exaggeration, it is one of, if not the greatest honor of my life. And with as much certainty as any human being can muster with respect to his or her future, I dare say it will be so until the day I breathe my last, inshallah, God willing. When Dr. Carter was giving my fellow inductees and me a tour of the chapel this morning and speaking to us of the yeast for the leaven that is the loaf of civil society in the United States, that is this place, that comes from this place, I knew I should at least metaphorically remove my two shoes, as did the Prophet Moses, Musa salam, on Sinai, because I was, I am, indeed, standing on sacred ground. It was all the more sacred because of the faces I saw on the walls of the gallery of portraits on either side of this beautiful nave. I fully realize that this gallery does in no way pretend to be an exhaustive representation of the communion of so many saints who share the special liberation, peace-building, and non-violent and reconciling charism of Blessed Martin. But given the latest agony in the all-too-long and all-too-painful jihad or struggle for a true recognition of human dignity in these United States, I couldn't help but imagine the image of the Mujahida, the striver, Judy Scott. She is the mother of Walter Scott, who was just one of the latest and most well-known victims of the heinous sin and scourge of structural racism. In her most recent and perhaps only media interview to date, Mrs. Scott said of the officer who murdered her son, quote, I have forgiveness. This, my friends, is the essence of the nonviolent striver or mujahida. The forgiveness of which this grieving mother speaks is no easy forgiveness. 
It is not a naive forgiveness that ignores or underplays the grip that evil can and does have on the human heart and on our world. It is rather the forgiveness which is nothing but perfectly consistent with the fight against this evil. For the refusal to forgive is the elixir of evil, insofar as it is the poison of our souls and thus our human communities. Many of you have probably heard the phrase, the refusal to forgive is like taking cyanide and waiting for your enemy to die. Where does this wisdom of Judy Scott come from? As a Christian, I think I know the answer from the Holy Spirit. But as we know, the Holy Spirit works in and through us, especially through the growth and transformation we necessarily experience as we journey through our short time here on earth. The honorable and righteous Mrs. Scott, this weeping mother who is living the nightmare of every mother and who nonetheless expresses the deepest faith possible, she learned to be the woman she is. She has been catechized both as a disciple of Jesus Christ and as a daughter of the civil rights movement. As is most certainly the case with Mrs. Scott, a lion's share of the growth and transformation we all experience on our life's journeys come through one of the primary media and primary engines of personal and social transformation, education. Now, one of the great ironies of the human story in general and of the history of the United States in particular is that the structures of oppression in our world have always been aware of the power of education. This is why these structures instantiate, instantiated and fought and fight so long and hard to preserve segregation. First in the places in which we make our homes, but as a close second in the places in which we educate ourselves and especially our youth. If, after all, Lies are to be told, they must be upheld, defended, and perpetuated precisely in those places where education, the discernment, production, and transmission of knowledge takes place. Those who are oppressed and on the margins must ideally be kept such and there by ideally keeping them from education. As you all know, one of the fulcra of preserving and perpetuating the utter brutality of chattel slavery in the U.S., were laws prohibiting teaching slaves to read. The structures of white power and privilege were well aware of the liberative power of education. And one of the fulcra of the Jim Crow attempt to maintain the socioeconomic dividend of slavery for the post-emancipation U.S. was, in fact, school segregation. But despite all its efforts, the structures of systemic oppression could not prevent the oppressed from imbibing the very awareness which was at the root of their oppression, that knowledge as the path to truth, as the Gospel of John reminds us, sets people free in a myriad of very pragmatic and concrete as well as deeply subtle and mysterious ways. As we know, this awareness was in many ways at the heart of the wisdom and courage of the ministry of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement in general. This awareness of the liberative power of knowledge, though, is something Dr. King derived from the revelation of his tradition. And this is a message that exists in other revealed traditions as well. It is clear in Islam, it is clear in the Quran. In Surah Taha, Ayah 114, God gives instructions to the Prophet himself as to what he should pray on approaching God's very words in these series of Qur'ans, of recitations, that the Prophet Muhammad was receiving. God tells the Prophet, قُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا Say, O oh my sustainer, increase my knowledge. There is another prophetic hadith it's Hassan Mashhur. Uh, for those of you who are interested in these things, <laughs> people debate whether it's Sahih or Daif. 
Uh, those people who know these terms know what I'm referring to, and if you don't know the terms, you don't want to be bogged down in these de details. But it says in Arabic, The Prophet was remembered to have said, seek knowledge even if it's in China. And they didn't mean that that part of the world that is now the People's Republic of China, seen in the Arabian Peninsula of the, 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 the seventh century, was the ends of the earth, basically. Seek knowledge to the ends of the earth. And Imam Reza of the Shiite tradition said, search and seek out knowledge from the cradle. And perhaps most strikingly was the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that teaching people how to read and the manumission of slaves are two of the primary ways in which one could make reparation for serious sin. And this very memorable teaching of the Prophet both implicitly and explicitly links liberation and education. Fatima Gulen is being honored this evening not only because he's a great human soul, like the great human souls of Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. King and Dr. Ikeda, but because what has led him to be that human soul, that true human being, is his striving to follow the example of his beloved prophet. And so I want to just speak now, in the time I have remaining, of education as a liberative force in the Hizmet movement and the teachings of Fatih al-Qulam. Before I do so as an academic, I just want to say a word about objectivity. This is something that uh, in, in, in the postmodern world is a contested issue. Can we ever be objective about anything? I would say probably not. Um, but uh, should we give up on objectivity as an aspirational value? I, I would say probably not. We need to strive for it at all times. But some people interpret objectivity in the sense of utter affective and spiritual detachment. You can only be objective about something you could ultimately care less about. If you care about someone or something, you can't be objective. If that's the kind of objectivity that is true objectivity, I don't even want to strive for that not one second of my life. I want to strive for the kind of objectivity that I try to strive for when I'm doing self-examination, or when I'm trying to sort of help my son deal with a problem he might be facing. I like to think that I can see the flaws in myself and in the people I love without stopping to love them, without stopping loving them, I should say. So, my confession is, I love Fadjur Gulen. And I love the His Men movement. But I also think that my love for Fethullah Gulen and the His Men movement does not rob me of my capacity to make some observations, some analytical observations that have some credibility and validity. And so that's what I propose to do. I want to start by just briefly defining the His Men movement for those of you that may be uh, not, a, not, not, not very familiar with it and then move on to sort of highlight maybe five salient features of the Hizmet movement that, that I hope will, will bring home for you the sense in which this movement and the teachings of Fatullah Gulen really embody this notion of education as a liberative force in the lives of individual human beings, in our communities, and therefore as a transformative force for the good um, in the world. So first, I define hizmet as a, by the way, the word hizmet is Turkish for service. It comes from the Arabic khidma, which means service, and that's what the word means. I define hizmet as a movement of personal, familial, and social transformation, tr transformation rooted in traditional Islamic spirituality, observance, and teachings, but appealing to people of diverse faiths and backgrounds who share its universal values. These values center around the importance of family, education, and personal responsibility for the welfare of others. Such values are oriented towards dialogue and cooperation, both within and across societies and cultures. 
for the purpose of pursuing greater justice and the greater solidarity of the human family. So that's how I would define it. A, a, a movement of personal, familial, and social transformation. A, a global spiritual renewal and social reform movement rooted in Islamic values, but not exclusively Muslim. A first major feature would perhaps be the inspiration it receives from the teachings, of course, of Fatul Gulen, and particularly his teaching on tolerance, and I'll say something about that word in just a second. As many of you know, the human spiritual inspiration behind his met is this evening's Gandhi King Ikeda Award Peace Honoree, an elderly Turkish gentleman who mows the lawn and washes the dishes by the name of M. Fethullah Gülen. Known affectionately to the millions who deeply admire and love him as a true man of God and eminently wise teacher, and I number myself among those, as Hoca Fendi, which means beloved teacher. There are many things I could say about this man. Indeed, I could spend hours talking about his incredible life story of selfless service to God in the humble service he has always striven to render to others. I could spend hours exploring with you the insightful and profound ideas he shares in his scores of books translated into scores of languages. But I'll do neither for three important reasons. The first is I would violate my trust to stay within the more than generous 30 minutes allotted for my remarks. The second is I know we're all committed to nonviolence, but nonetheless I'd like to get out of here in one piece. And the third is that Hodger Fendi would be upset, really if he thought I was spending my precious time talking about him, rather than the mission to which he has dedicated his life and to which he has tirelessly invited countless others. So I thought I would encapsulate the teachings of Fethullah Gülen and what I have come to identify as one of the guiding principles or central themes of his men by talking to you very briefly about tolerance, except I don't want to talk to you about tolerance. I want to talk to you about the Turkish word that is most often translated as tolerance in the writings and teachings of Fethullah Gülen. But before I tell you what that word is, let me just read a very famous quote from the poetry of Fethullah Gülen. In English, I, could, I would butcher it in Turkish, although it would be far more beautiful in Turkish. Be so tolerant that your bosom becomes wide as the ocean. Be inspired with faith and love of human beings. Let there be no troubled souls to whom you do not offer a hand and about whom you remain unconcerned." End quote. Now, be so tolerant. You know, tolerance doesn't have the best valence, the best resonance in contemporary U.S. American English, at least. For many of us, it has a sense of putting up with someone or something that irritates you. You know, containing your anger and irritation, being able to bear with difference and diversity even though it really bugs you. That's not what the word in Turkish means by a long shot. The word in Turkish is hoşgülü, hoşgülü. And it comes from two Turkish words, hoş meaning good, and görmek meaning to see. The word hoşgülü is seeing the other in a good light, or seeing the goodness in the other, the other being one's fellow human beings, or any constituent element of God's creation. Fethullah Gülen, in his own way, demands that all the people of his net, and invites all the people of the world, to practice Hosh Guru. And he says there's a really good reason for this. And that is because God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who brought us all into being, who is perfection, who has no flaws, who is all just and all good, looks at his creation and particularly at, as, at us as flawed and sinful human beings through the lens of Hosh Guru. God looks at the goodness in us and seeks through God's guidance to 
augment that goodness. And we, therefore, must do the same in our relationship with God's magnificent creation around us, and especially in our relationship with our fellow human beings. Another element is the commitment to education, which I've been alluding to all along. Uh, there are over 1,500 schools inspired by the educational philosophy and pedagogical methods that are, that are imparted in the wisdom of Fatih Lekulam. And actually, a very important part of uh, the philosophy of Fatih Lekulam, the educational philosophy of Fatih Lekulam, is education by example. In fact, he actually distinguishes between teaching or instruction and education. Teaching happens in the classroom. But teaching is only one dimension of education. Education is the formation, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, of the entire human being. And that we do most effectively with others when we strive to embody the very ideals that we think God wants enhanced and grown and nurtured in all of us. I can't help but make a connection between this approach to education and this sacred place, this chapel and Morehouse College, I was walking on the campus this morning, and I was called Sir more times than I can count. And I thought, I, I felt so dignified. And I felt the dignity of all these young men who called me Sir. They called me sir out of their profound sense of dignity because they're getting educated here. They're not just getting taught. Their spirit, their dignity is being grounded and augmented. And this is really so resonant with the pedagogical philosophy of Fatih Lekulam. Another element of, of uh, the Hizmet movement that is, that is relative or, or connected to this idea of education as a liberative force is what I call the mutually critical assessment of tradition and modernity. Fatou de Bilen talks about how we have to use modern ideas to critique and better understand traditional values and practices, and at the same time use traditional teachings and values and practices to better assess and critically evaluate modernity and its various aspects. The point being a deepening of personal faith and this ongoing jihad or struggle for social justice. Connected with this, another point, the relationship between what's in Turkish called aql, the kalb, the intellect and the heart, or intelligence and compassion. Fatou de Gulen teaches a lot about the importance of democracy and stresses how important for both any democratic or plural society the integration in its citizens of the heart and the mind are. Good solutions to problems can only be the fruit of hard critical analyses, but every rational solution to a problem must be judged according to how it affects the lives of people, especially the most vulnerable among us. The ones the Quran refers to as the mustadafun, the ones the New Testament refers to as those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want to end by just telling you one personal story that reflects my own deep personal encounter with his Met's commitment to the liberative power of education. And I think, I think you'll instantly see its connection to the values of the civil rights movement and the foundational values of this sacred place we are in this evening. I had occasion a couple of years ago to visit South Africa. I was going during Ramadan to give some talks at interfaith iftar dinners in Cape Town and Johannesburg and Durban. And when I was in Johannesburg, I had occasion to visit Soweto. Many of you know Soweto as a township that stands as a symbol of apartheid oppression. 
and the backbreaking poverty of that oppression. I went to Soweto escorted by teachers from a Hizmet school because many of the students, in fact, the vast majority of the students in one of their schools, this was a boys' school, come from Soweto and they go regularly to the township to visit the parents because a vital uh, component of the educational philosophy of Hizmet is the teacher relating to the parents and bringing the parents in to the educational, right, not just the teaching, but the educational development of their sons and daughters. When I got back to the school later that day, I, I had the wonderful privilege of speaking to some of these amazing young men, all black South Africans. And after I spoke to them, I was, was blessed by the stories they told me and the wisdom that was in their young hearts. I asked the principal a little bit about them, uh, you know, demographics, other than the fact that most of them are from Soweto, and I asked about their religious affiliation, and he said, Brother Scott, they're 80% Roman Catholics like you. I had to fight back tears from coming to my eyes. I probably shouldn't have fought that, because uh, Turkish men are used to crying, and, and, and when looking at other men cry. Um, to think that these members of the Hizmet movement travel thousands of miles away from their home to a culture very different than their own, with very little financial resources, their pockets and hearts filled mostly with ikhlas, which is the Quranic word for sincerity. To give my young black Catholic brothers and sisters in the girls' school a chance at a better life. And I could see from what they said to me that that is indeed, through the hard work of the Hizmet people and through the grace of God, what they were receiving. I hope these remarks have given you some insight into this movement, which animates the Atlantic Institute, um, which has in some ways uh, contributed to this emerging great partnership between ins institutes like the Atlantic Institute, movements like the Hizmet Movement, and a storied and noble and esteemed institution like Morehouse College, and what it represents as the yeast producer of the loaf of American civic life. Thank you very much for your attention.